Hello, everyone. My name is Michel. Thank you very much for joining us. Today, we are extremely fortunate to host Dr. Lauren Kalia, Associate Professor and Clinician Scientist at the University of Toronto. Dr. Kalia will be talking to us about drug repurposing for Parkinson's therapies. Some of the most promising therapies being developed at the moment are based on drug repurposing. For instance, exanotide and ambroxol, making this webinar essential for anyone suffering from Parkinson's or caring for someone suffering from Parkinson's. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only. So if you are seeking medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, you should really consult a medical professional. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. If you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So for those of you who don't know us yet, No Silver Bullet is managed by Mark Lambert and myself with the aim of sharing Parkinson's expertise. We aim to help you and frankly, to motivate you to become well-informed generalist in your condition in order to make informed choices on how to adapt your lifestyle to manage your symptoms and slow down disease progression. We are organizing Zoom sessions like today's with researchers and PD specialists to update you on the latest advances in science and medicine, nutrition, exercise, wellness, and technology. We then post the recordings of our sessions on YouTube and on Spotify, and we also post short videos on TikTok and Instagram. The details for all those media are medium uh, are available on the chat section in your, at the bottom of your screen as well as on our website. Our website is nosilverbullet4pd.com, nosilverbullet number 4 pdcom But let's come back to today's topic and to Lorraine, who will be talking to us about drug repurposing for Parkinson's therapy. Lorraine, the stage is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle and Mark, for inviting me today. Um, this is an amazing initiative. Uh, I, I love the title, No Silver Bullet. Um, today, I'm not going to have a silver bullet uh, because I think that's not what um, what's possible. Uh, and so I think our weapons against Parkinson's disease include education, which is definitely what you guys are doing here. Um, and from my point of view, also research. So I'm going to share with you some research and also some concepts uh, around drug repurposing. I'm just going to bring up my slides. And uh, I'll get started. Um, I'm hoping for the next 30 minutes or so to talk uh, to you all about drug repurposing for Parkinson's disease uh, as therapies. Um, this is a modified version of a talk that I gave at the World Parkinson Congress a couple of months ago. And uh, I hope it will be useful information for everyone who is attending. And I look forward to the conversation uh, that we'll have uh, after the, this talk. What I'm going to hope to accomplish uh, over the next 30 minutes or so is to really um, explain uh, the principles of drug repurposing. This may be a concept that uh, many of you have heard of before, maybe some of you are incredibly familiar with it, uh, but I'll try and bring us all onto the same page as to what this actual um, strategy is. And um, not only what it is, but why we should be considering pursuing it or why it's being pursued in Parkinson's disease, specifically what are the advantages um, to, to people with Parkinson's disease for uh, researchers taking this approach. I'm gonna talk about how drugs can be repurposed, how we can discover these drugs uh, for Parkinson's disease therapies um, over a variety of different strategies. And I'm going to really focus on some of the work that's being done within my research group as simply examples of a very much broader field of drug repurposing research that's being done. And then um, lastly, again, touching on some of the work that we're doing here in Toronto, Canada, I'm gonna to talk about how we can go even one step further uh, from just repurposing drugs uh, and taking old drugs, but making them almost new again uh, with new technologies. And uh, hopefully this again will bring us closer to um, new therapies for Parkinson's disease. So to start with, what is drug repurposing and why is it advantageous? Again, many of you may be familiar with this concept, but I'm just going to review it again so that we're all on the same page. Um, an actual definition for drug repurposing, 
Uh, sometimes people refer to this as drug repositioning, although there are some um, minor differences between the two, but if for today's for today's purpose, we, we equate them. Um, this entity, entity of drug repurposing is taking old drugs, so drugs that are already approved for use in humans for treatment of other diseases and applying them to a new disease. Meaning taking a drug that is prescribed for disease X and using it for disease Y. I'll give you an example that might be familiar to many of you, although you may not be aware that it's actually a, a repurposed drug. And even some of the physicians who are prescribing this drug might not be aware that it's a repurposed drug. But the example here is amantadine, uh, which for many of you will look something similar to this, uh, this red kind of capsule. Interestingly, this pill that's now really primarily prescribed for Parkinson's disease, and in some cases for multiple sclerosis, was actually a medication that was developed for the treatment and prophylaxis of influenza back in the 1960s. And that's why this drug was developed. That's why it came to be. By the 1970s, its use as a influenza medication was, was less used. There were much better treatments available. Um, and it became uh, repurposed for the for the treatment of actual motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And I'll talk to you uh, a little bit later on as to how that kind of happened. And so by the 1970s, the indication for this drug was actually not for what it was originally developed for, which was the flu, but it was actually being prescribed for Parkinson's disease for motor symptoms. There's actually a second aspect of repurposing that happened for this drug in the 1990s, when the drug was no longer primarily used for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but began being used primarily for the treatment of levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And that's, that's its primary use in Parkinson's disease right now. So this is a drug that has had different um, indications over the course of this past number of decades. And this is just one example of how a drug that was originally intended for one purpose can find its way as a drug for another purpose. So this strategy of drug repurposing in the context of Parkinson's disease can be applied to symptomatic therapies and amantadine is one example, meaning that it's a medication that's used to treat the actual symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But it can also be used in the context of disease modifying therapies. And that's what I'm gonna focus on here. And I'd say a large proportion of the, the drug repurposing research that's being done, rightly so, is to see if we can find drugs that can actually modify uh, the course of Parkinson's disease. So hopefully slow the disease progress. Um, and in the best case scenario, actually stop the disease in its tracks. The reason why we would want to take this approach, some people might ask, well, you know, aren't new drugs better? Uh, you know, aren't drugs that we already knew about? Uh, shouldn't we already have known about them? Um, isn't 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 a newer drug and and being uh, being kind of um, not looking not looking to the to the old compounds that we had? Isn't that the better strategy if we really wanted to want to tackle Parkinson's disease? Um, and I'd say that there are uh, a couple of reasons why drug repurposing has found itself to be quite attractive uh, in the field of Parkinson's disease, as well as other conditions. Um, and, and one of the big motivators is what we all are hoping for, which is a treatment that is sooner, um, uh, sooner uh, in the clinics, that we can actually, that I can prescribe sooner, that you can take sooner. Um, and how do we do that? Um, one of the strategies is to actually make drug development shorter, faster, and cheaper. I put here just um, the pipeline that one drug has to go through to find its way into the clinic. So it uh, typically will start in the laboratory uh, at, 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 a, at a bench uh, where discoveries are being made. And to actually then get it into human studies, it has to enter this pipeline of clinical trials, which begin at phase one, go to phase two, phase three, phase four, as I'm sure many of you have heard about. And along this pipeline, many, many drugs will fall off the pipeline. They'll fail at a stage. Um, and um, each stage can be various lengths of time and various costs. And ultimately, to get a drug from the laboratory studies all the way to actually phase four and, and, and into the clinic is, is, a, is quite a lengthy and expensive process, particularly in the neurodegenerative disease arena. So these are just estimates, but it's estimated that for a chronic neurodegenerative disease such as Parkinson's disease, that to get an actual drug, one can spend um, over a billion dollars. Um, and the process of getting something from the lab to the clinic 
can take up to 15 years, which is obviously a huge amount of time, especially when we're hoping to have something sooner rather than later. And the other important component, uh, which I alluded to, is that there are many drugs that enter into this pipeline, but then fall off and fail. And so only about 10% of compounds that kind of start at the beginning will actually make its way all the way through the process to actually be um, approved by an agency such as the FDA so that it can actually be um, prescribed. So for that reason, the idea of repurposing is to actually shorten the time and the cost to develop a drug because we don't necessarily have to start here at the laboratory studies phase uh, and spend as much time there. We can actually do a, a, do a short amount of time in the laboratory studies phase and then quickly be able to move on to the phase one and the phase two phases because these drugs have already been shown to be safe in humans for a different disease. And um, as I mentioned, uh, this is a very active area of research in Parkinson's disease for disease modifying therapies, as well as for symptomatic therapies. And I just wanna show you uh, and give you an idea of just a breadth of research that's going on um, to find new treatments for Parkinson's disease and where repurposing drugs falls into this. And to do this, what I'm putting up here on the left-hand side of the screen is a nice figure that was put together by uh, Kevin McFarthing, who is a person with Parkinson's and a, and a, a patient advocate, um, together with uh, colleagues, including individuals from uh, Cure Parkinson's organization, such as Simon Stott, um, to just show all of the different drugs that are in clinical trials. And so that phase one, phase two, phase three um, picture that I showed you earlier in the pipeline is, is shown here by the different rungs on these um, on this kind of uh, the trunk of a tree. So the so the different circles. So this is phase one, phase two, phase three. And each in within each of the circles are the different drugs that are being tested in each of those clinical trial phases. The top half of the circle represents disease modifying therapies and the bottom half are symptomatic therapies. And what I want to draw your attention to from this um, graph or from this diagram is that if you looked at each of the individual drugs that are being tested within the disease modifying therapy treatment pipeline, there are a large number that are actually old drugs that are being repurposed. So over a third of the drugs. So I counted out the ones in here that are actually um, already approved drugs and are being repurposed for Parkinson's disease or ones that have been derived from a drug that's repurposed. And over a third of them uh, uh, come from that. And they're, they're listed out here just to be a little bit clearer that I pulled them out of this figure. But you can see there's a couple in the phase one um, uh, domain. There's a large number that are being tested in the phase two trials right now. And there's a smaller number that are in the phase three trials. This is published in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease back uh, earlier this year. And this is actually just a snapshot in time. Uh, I wanted to point uh, your attention to um, a list that's uh, basically a running um, live list uh, that Kevin keeps at his website, uh, which is the Hope List. Um, it's a uh, it's a, basically an Excel document that uh, anybody you can copy and paste that link and, and visit it. And he, he, I think the, I looked at it this morning and it was updated just back in May. Uh, and so he keeps it up to date and you can, you can stay up to date on to what the actual different um, uh, therapies that are in the different clinical trials. So it's a, it's a really useful um, uh, resource. Uh, and approximately once a year, he'll um, put together a manuscript like this for the Journal of Parkinson's Disease, where we kind of see that snapshot in time for the year. So um, this was just to show you how much drug repurposing research is being done. Uh, and as another example of um, the push for drug repurposing in our field, uh, Cure Parkinson's, which is a funding agency um, in the UK, is very much dedicated uh, to the idea that putting funding towards uh, repurposed drugs will bring us treatments sooner um, and, and hopefully cheaper. And based on that, they have an actual initiative called the International Linked Clinical Trials Initiative, uh, which is, as I've listed here, a global program led by Cure Parkinson's as well as the Van Andel Institute in the US. And what they actually do is look at potential disease modifying therapies, the majority of which are drugs for repurposing, and prioritize those that they think have good science behind them, have a good track record, um, have good safety data so far, and um, 
and and then put funding behind them to actually be able to bring these trials not just to understanding them at the research bench but to actually bring them into clinical trials and this is uh, provided to me from Leah from Cure Parkinson's who summarized uh, what they have in the pipeline so far and you can see these are all different repurposed drugs that they have been um, supporting through um, their Cure Parkinson's grants and I just wanted to touch on the two up here um, that Michelle and Mark thought would be quite interesting to the audience because they are the two drugs that are actually in phase three trials, so the ones closest to um, coming to clinic. So those are uh, tr trials that are looking at this drug exenatide and this drug Ambroxol. So exenatide is um, a drug uh, that uh, falls under the category of GLP-1 receptor agonist meaning that it's a drug that can activate this receptor called GLP-1. Uh, I show a diagram here of a, just a cartoon depiction of what might be happening in the cell when this GLP-1 receptor gets activated. So the GLP-1 agonist or exenatide binds to this receptor and a whole bunch of things happen within a cell, including a brain cell, when this receptor gets activated. This is actually a drug that was developed for diabetes, and this is why it's repurposed. It's a drug that's being that's been developed for diabetes, and we're seeing if it can be used in Parkinson's disease. And its use in diabetes is clearly linked to its ability, which you can see out here, to actually release insulin. So if you activate this receptor, there's insulin release, and this is obviously good in the context of diabetes. It's also good in the context of weight loss, and so this class of drugs is also being marketed and um, prescribed for weight loss. But interestingly, um, what this cartoon is showing is that it does a lot of other things in the cell too. And just as a summary at the bottom here, these are a whole bunch of different things that it does in a cell that one would imagine could be beneficial for a Parkinson's disease cell. And so for example, it can reduce inflammation. Um, it can help uh, a cell and neuron survive. It's good for memory formation. And it's good for reducing um, alpha-synuclein, which is a protein that aggregates in the brain. So there's a, a whole number of reasons why this drug, yeah, is good for, uh, for diabetes, but it also does a whole number of important things um, in, in brain cells that uh, have benefits for uh, the context of Parkinson's and why it's been examined uh, in Parkinson's disease. And so exenatide itself has already gone through a phase two trial and it showed uh, that there was improvements in, in motor scores. So the way that hands move and feet move and, and walking in Parkinson's disease. And importantly, there's this ongoing phase three trial, which we're all looking forward to hoping to see results um, sometime in 2024. Other people are, uh, are examining aspects related to imaging. And I think what's really important here about the exenatide story is not just that exenatide is being investigated, but it has led to the investigation of a number of different drugs in the same class. So uh, liraglutides, um, lixacenatides, um, these are other uh, GLP receptor agonists that are in clinical trials. So liraglutide showed promising results um, for non-motor scores in the phase two trial, and that's just coming out in, in publication. And I was just uh, discussing with Michelle earlier that at uh, the most recent MDS Congress last week, there were results presented for lixacenatide that also look promising and similar to the benefits that we've seen with exenatide, which shows promise, I think, for this um, area of investigation. Uh, I just point out that there are derivatives of exenatide. So this is a pegylated version of exenatide. This is a controlled release version of exenatide that are also being studied. And then semaglutide is a very commonly prescribed uh, GLP receptor agonist that's also been being studied. And interestingly, uh, there's offshoots from this type of drug uh, too. So, um, uh, so there are other drugs that can actually affect this pathway in a different way uh, that are also being in, investigated in Parkinson's disease. And so I think that um, one, what, what the Xenotide short story shows is that repurposed drugs don't only just bring repurposed drugs and a single drug to study, but actually can open up a whole window uh, and an area of investigation that hadn't existed before um, that go far beyond just the one single drug that we're trying to repurpose. 
The second example that I wanted to just touch on was ambroxol because this is also uh, about to start uh, in a phase three trial. Um, it's a small molecule uh, that was actually um, initially developed and used as a, as a cough medication. Uh, and from a lot of work uh, in the laboratory, it was shown to have benefit uh, possibly for Parkinson's disease, specifically in the context of an enzyme that we all have in our brain called glucocerebrosidase, or for short, GKs. So this is a, a protein in all of our brains that has a job. Uh, what it does is it catalyzes an enzymatic reaction. It breaks down one chemical into other chemicals. And when it is impaired, uh, we think that the chemical that it doesn't break down appropriately is harmful to brain cells. And in particular, it seems to be a chemical that facilitates the aggregation of alpha nuclein, this protein that aggregates in Parkinson's disease brains that we don't want to aggregate. And so when this enzyme is impaired, um, then you have more aggregation of alpha nuclein, and when you have more alpha, uh, aggregation of alpha nuclein, then you have more loss of brain cells. So if there were a way to actually in, enhance the activity of this enzyme, um, that would be beneficial. And indeed, ambroxol appears to be that kind of chemical. It can actually take glucocerebrosidase, bring it to the right place in the cell, and make it work better. Um, and so this has been studied. Um, Interestingly, we think that this enzyme is defective in, uh, in Parkinson's disease brains in general, but there's also a genetic form of Parkinson's disease where the gene that, that, that codes for this enzyme is actually mutated, and that's the GBA gene. And so we call people who have a mutation in the GBA gene, we call their disease GBA Parkinson's disease. And so understandably, this ambroxol has been studied in individuals who have a mutation in this gene, and has also been studied in people who have Parkinson's disease without the mutation. And a phase two trial has shown that it's self safe and well tolerated. It needed to be used at higher concentrations than was used than it's used as a cough medication, uh, and it was important to show that this was um, able to be done in people with Parkinson's and safe at the higher concentrations. And um, it, it was also shown that it got into the brain, uh, which is obviously important for a, for a drug that we want to have benefit within the brain. So there's a phase three trial that's been designed um, and, is, and is set to start uh, again, either in late 2023 or early 2024. Um, and interestingly, when I reviewed uh, all of the clinical trials that are published uh, recently, there are, are at least five other clinical trials in the phase two stage that are testing ambroxol in either Parkinson's disease or a relative of Parkinson's disease. So there's definitely other trials that are looking at it in GBA Parkinson's disease. There are trials that are looking specifically in individuals who have Parkinson's disease dementia, and also trials looking at people who have uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, which is uh, depending on who you speak to, either a, a, a distinct disease from Parkinson's disease, but related or uh, falls within the umbrella of Parkinson's disease. So there's, this is a very, very active area of investigation. And I think we'll start to see um, some, some results uh, as from, from some of these clinical trials to, to tell us uh, and give us a signal as to whether or not this is going to be uh, a fruitful area of investigation. Um, I just wanted to point out, because as I was preparing, if I, any of those uh, topics uh, sound interesting to you and you want to hear more, I just want to point out that there's already great uh, speakers from uh, the No Silver Bullet 4PD uh, website that have given webinars on this. So uh, Dr. Shapira is heading the clinical trial, the phase three clinical trial uh, with Ambroxol. Um, and I'm sure that he gives a great talk here to talk about it in more detail. Dr. Foltini uh, has been leading the way with the exenotide work. And then Kevin McFarthing, uh, the person with Parkinson's uh, and the patient advocate who has the, um, the hope list um, that talks about uh, areas related to drug development here. So I encourage you to, to go back and look at those uh, webinars as well. So with that, I'm going to move on to point two, uh, which is, OK, so here are these drugs that are repurposed. But how did we find them uh, and how do we find more? Uh, and I'm going to just talk through, I think, maybe three, three primary ways um, that we can find drugs uh, to repurpose in Parkinson's disease. And the first way is serendipity, meaning it just kind of happens. <laughs> and I come back to the example of amantadine uh, as, a, as a kind of brilliant example of really serendipity. Uh, I told you that this drug was first developed for influenza, 
And back in the 1960s, a uh, patient uh, who had influenza but also had Parkinson's disease was put on amantadine and told her physician, mm, my Parkinson's disease symptoms seemed better when I was taking amantadine for the flu. Um, and since I've been off of it, uh, my Parkinson's symptoms seem worse. And this led to um, uh, further investigation and studies and actually demonstration that, yes, indeed, amantadine is good for motor symptoms and Parkinson's disease. And I think it's just a wonderful example of um, having, you know, I had the importance of listening uh, to people who have the disease and what they can contribute. So, so that kind of observation led to the first repurposing of that drug for use in Parkinson's disease. And then similarly, just clinical observation uh, around the 1960s, 70s, levodopa was obviously developed at around the same time. And it became apparent that uh, levodopa-induced dyskinesia were a consequence uh, of uh, having Parkinson's disease and being on levodopa. And just the clinical observation that people who were taking amantadine could actually have a reduction in their levodopa-induced dyskinesias led to the second repurposing step of uh, amantadine for it being used as levodopa uh, for levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And again, this was based on clinical observation. Nobody expected or, or hypothesized that amantadine was going to be useful necessarily for this purpose. It was a, a serendipitous observation that uh, clinicians and patients made uh, that led to this uh, discovery. Serendipity, of course, um, relies on, on these events happening. Um, there's no way to necessarily control them, and, and maybe you'll have a serendipitous uh, observation in this next year, maybe we won't have a, a useful one for the next decade. So this obviously serendipity alone is not going to get us particularly far. Um, so we need other approaches and, and another uh, logical approach is to actually have a hypothesis, uh, an actual expectation uh, of what a drug might do and then test that hypothesis. And so this is the hypothesis driven approach. And this has been a very active area of uh, leading to repurposed drugs. And I give kind of two very classic examples over the past couple of decades that were based on hypotheses. And so the first one is around this drug called Isratapine, which is a blood pressure medication. Um, and it was used uh, in a clinical trial. But this was based on a hypothesis that was tested in the laboratory, which was that um, L-type calcium channels, which are certain types of channels that we have in our brains, and what the actual uh, Isratapine acts on, so it, it binds to these channels, the idea here was that um, these channels are important mediators of bringing calcium into, into brain cells, and too much calcium in brain cells is harmful. So if you could use azratapine, which blocks these channels, um, possibly that would reduce um, uh, loss of dopaminergic brain cells. And so this was tested in the laboratory, looked promising, tested in a clinical trial, and unfortunately, at least the way that the initial clinical trial was developed um, did not demonstrate it to be beneficial from a disease modifying point of view. But this is being refined a little bit further as, as the researchers delve a little bit deeper into the data as it may be that certain, certain, um, certain patients with Parkinson's disease can benefit from this drug, but not all. Another hypothesis-driven approach that you may have heard about is related to this drug called inosine. And the hypothesis here was based on our understanding of a chemical that we all have in our bodies called urate. And it's actually a naturally occurring antioxidant. And so it does a lot of good things in our body. It, it mops up oxidative damage. And we know that oxidative damage is bad for uh, brain cells. And so the idea here is that if we gave a drug that I could actually boost uh, the urate, um, that this might be a beneficial for dopaminergic neurons and Parkinson's disease brains. And again, Scott looked promising in the, in, in the laboratory um, and came to clinical trial, uh, but unfortunately didn't show that it had disease modifying therapies in that context. But again, I think there is there are lessons to be learned from these clinical trials and um, and understanding who might actually benefit from these drugs is probably the next step in what we have to understand to really be able to um, better um, design clinical trials and test drugs and know whether or not indeed they uh, work or don't work. The other approach, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this, is uh, screening. So this is another approach to find repurposed drugs. And here I'm just gonna touch again on work that we've done in our laboratory, although I can tell you this kind of approach is done worldwide uh, in different strategies. And uh, this is a good thing because we want lots of different laboratories um, doing this kind of work. 
And the screening that we did uh, was based around um, alpha synuclein. I, I mentioned this protein already. I'll just maybe take a step back. I think we're probably all familiar with it, but just again, so we're all on the same page. Alpha synuclein is a protein that we all have in our brains. Um, it's actually a pretty highly abundant protein in our brains and other regions in our body. Uh, and what we are working hypothesis in the field of Parkinson's disease is that something goes awry with alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease. It starts to um, aggregate or bind to itself uh, and form uh, different uh, what we call conformations or aggregates within the brain that uh, in some way are harmful to brain cells. And so that's depicted in this cartoon here. Monomers are just a single alpha synuclein molecule. And then these protofibrils or oligomers or these fibrils are when these molecules actually come together and stick together. And then in their very biggest form are in the Lewy bodies or Lewy neurites, which is what a neuropathologist will see under the microscope um, when they're looking at a brain at autopsy. Um, and so there's a lot of debate as to how alpha synuclein might be harmful, if alpha synuclein is harmful because of the aggregates. But I, I think it's fair to say that the consensus in the field currently is that there are definitely forms of alpha synuclein that um, uh, are, are detrimental to brain cells. And I won't specifically uh, go through all of the data for, for what there are for each of them. But in particular, oligomers are felt to, to possibly be harmful forms of alpha synuclein. And so our strategy was to say, are there drugs out there that we can repurpose that can actually reduce alpha synuclein oligomers if these are indeed the type of alpha synuclein that are harmful in Parkinson's disease? And we wanted to look at a lot of different drugs. We uh, looked at 620, well, we wanted to look at 620 drugs that are already approved for human use. And we narrowed ourselves down to drugs that were um, available um, through our provincial formulary. And the purpose for this is uh, we also wanted to be able to, to do some um, uh, research related to um, health databases. Uh, and so uh, this was the reason why we chose these 620 drugs. And what we did in this screening uh, experiment was two decades ago, uh, we would have taken, bought, purchased those 620 drugs. Um, we would have um, brought them to our laboratory and we would have tried to miniaturize the way that we do work in the laboratory to be able to test all 620 drugs at once and screen, meaning look for which ones are doing what we're hoping they could do, which is reduce alpha synuclein oligomers. Thankfully, though, we didn't have to do that as we collaborated uh, relatively early on with IBM, who had uh, a platform uh, based on uh, artificial intelligence, primarily machine learning, to actually try and reduce that work for us. And uh, what we did with them was instead of buying all of those drugs, testing them at the bench, is we used this AI technology to ask the question, which of these drugs are most likely to reduce alpha synuclein oligomers? Can you rank them for us? And um, we collaborated with IBM to be able to use this technology to do that with their computer scientists. Um, I'm not a computer, computer scientist at all, uh, so I'm just going to give you um, uh, the kind of basic, my basic understanding of the way that this worked. It required that um, we give the uh, algorithm examples of compounds that we knew that could already reduce alpha synuclein oligomers in the lab, and then this list of 620 that we wanted uh, for them to, for it to, to, to rank for us. And it had the capability of, of basically reading. So it has this uh, natural language processing. It was able to read all the abstracts in the literature around all of these compounds. And based on that, gave each compound a fingerprint. And finger, the compounds that had fingerprints closest to the drugs that we knew could reduce alpha synuclein oligomers, it ranked high. And compounds that had a fingerprint very different from the compounds that we know that can reduce alpha synuclein, it ranked low. And so it gave us this ranked list of one to 620 of drugs that uh, could potentially reduce alpha synuclein oligomers. We took the top 40. Um, and then for these ones, we brought them to our laboratory. We purchased those drugs uh, and we have the capability in our laboratory of actually mimicking alpha synuclein oligomers in a dish in cells. And we treated these cells with the 40 drugs that were ranked high by the AI algorithm. 
and looked for the ones that were able to actually in the cells reduce alpha synuclein oligomers, but also not cause a lot of harm to the cells. And so with that, we were able to reduce that list back down to six hits. So we had six good compounds that could actually reduce alpha synuclein oligomers in cells, not cause harm to the cells. And from there, we took those six hits and then tested them in animal models in the laboratory. And the first animal model that we used uh, was a worm model or a C. elegans model. And I show you a, a video of one here. These are very small animals, one millimeter in length. Um, and uh, they're very powerful uh, in that um, they are easy to cultivate, um, inexpensive uh, to have in the laboratory, and then have uh, are able to actually manipulate them genetically. So this animal has alpha synuclein uh, in its uh, dopaminergic neurons. So it also has dopaminergic neurons, and it is behaving abnormally because of this. This curling or coiling activity that you see when it takes on a circle, that's an abnormal movement. And we can actually count those or score that. And so what we did in this scenario was treat uh, these animals with uh, the six hits that we had that looked promising from cells and looked to, to see which ones could actually reverse this abnormal movement, indicating that it was reversing the harm that alpha synuclein was causing in these animals. And from that, we identified five of the compounds that were able to do that. And we picked the one that looked most promising in that it wasn't previously tested in a Parkinson's disease context, um, and that it also had good brain penetration uh, that it was known. And so the one drug that we found was a drug called rifibutin, and we tested this in, an, in a rodent model of Parkinson's disease. And in this model, uh, we caused loss of dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra, which is the primary region that's affected in Parkinson's disease by making it make too much alpha synuclein. And so what's just shown here are those actual regions within the brain. So up here, and, and what, what you really wanna pay attention to is the amount of blue that you see. So if there's a lot of blue, that means there's a lot of cells, that's a good thing. If there's a little bit of blue, that means there's a little bit of cells and that's representative neurodegeneration. And so, we caused neurodegeneration in these animals. We treated them with this one drug that we thought was promising from our repurposing screen called rifibutin. And then we asked, does the rifibutin reduce the loss of brain cells in these models? And indeed it did. And that's just what's shown here in this bar graph. So this is a bar graph representing the amount of brain cells in an animal who wasn't treated with rifibutin. And this is, you can see a larger amount of cells, a bigger bar graph showing that there was actually a reduction in the amount of loss of brain cells with the treatment of rifibutin. And with that, um, we think that this is good evidence that rifibutin has disease modifying potential. We're testing it in further in uh, a, another rodent model to get further validation of this finding. Um, and then together with Cure Parkinson's, um, we are looking to potentially bring this into an early clinical trial uh, to look for safety and, and initial signals of biomarkers. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to touch on this last point, which is how can old drugs be combined with new technologies? I've just talked to you about old drugs. Most of these are ones that you take either by mouth or, or uh, for exenatide by injection. Um, but how can we actually change uh, and take advantage of these drugs um, and bring them into kind of the, 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 the present and, and take advantage of all the other technologies that are happening around us? And for this, I'm gonna give you again an example of work that we're doing in Toronto uh, around um, <clears throat> using uh, MR or magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound. And uh, this is a, a technology that gets a lot of press. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Uh, and it does, um, it, it in and of itself is a, is a complex technology. Um, I just wanna maybe break it down for you a little bit because sometimes when people refer to, um, uh, to FUS, uh, which is often the term that's used when we talk about MR guided uh, uh, focused ultrasound, um, we're not always talking, there's, there's different, there's nuances to it and there's different ways that it's applied. So the first thing is that it's um, a technology in which magnetic resonance or so the, the same MRI, the where you get your brain scanned, um, is used to help guide where um, ultrasound beams are focused. And so that's where the MI guided focused ultrasound terminology comes from. 
And the major application for this technology right now is what we call thermal ablation. And that's where the ultrasound beams are focused to a very specific part in the brain at a high frequency with the intention of actually causing a small damage within the brain. And this has been used for tremor. Um, this is being studied in Parkinson's disease. And you would ask, why would you want to make a small damage in the brain? And the purpose for that is because there are circuits within the brain that can be um, dysfunctional in certain conditions. So in essential tremor, a certain circuit becomes dysfunctional. And if you can actually break that circuit by making a small um, a damage within the circuit, you can actually stop that circuit from, from performing um, maladaptively, and then the tremor is reduced. And similar types of circuits are being investigated in Parkinson's disease. Another application, though, of focused ultrasound, and what I'm going to talk about for the rest of, the, of this talk, is using it actually not as a high frequency to cause damage in the brain, but actually at a very low frequency to cause no damage in the brain, but actually to take advantage of its, um, of its mechanical force to open up what we call the blood-brain barrier. And that's what I'm going to talk about and just explain that a little bit further uh, in a bit. I'll just touch on here, which I'm not gonna talk about at all, an even more, I'd say, burgeoning area or a more area of exploration right now is using, again, low frequency ultrasound to affect um, the actual uh, firing of brain cells and in, in that way uh, affect circuits in the brain, not by causing damage to the brain, by just affecting the activity of brain cells and that's through neuromodulation. And that's a much more um, nascent area of investigation, but probably an area that you're gonna hear about more and more in the future. Regarding the blood-brain barrier, again, just to get us all on the same page, although I'm sure many of you have heard of this uh, term before, it is a network of blood vessels and tissues that we all have in our brain it's there um, to actually prevent substances from reaching our brain because we don't want bad toxins to get to our brain. We don't want um, bacteria or viruses to get to our brain. So we've all evolved this blood brain barrier to basically keep our brain safe from, from, from harmful, harmful substances. And I've just depicted it here as this uh, gray uh, dotted line. So it's this, it's this physical barrier. Um, it also has the capability of pushing substances away through enzymatic and, and efflux, and it, and, and it does, it does um, that in that way as well. In one moment. Sorry, I just have to take a cough break. One moment. We are very lucky to have Lauren with us tonight because she's just recovering from a respiratory infection that she caught while she was at the conference abroad. So let's just give her a few seconds to recover. Apologies. Um, I'm just going to take a little cough drop. Okay. Um, so... Um, the blood-brain barrier is there uh, to, to protect our brain, but it also is, it results in things that we want to get into our brain from not being able to do that. So in particular, drugs. So small molecules, bigger molecules such as peptides and proteins, sometimes we want those to, to use those as treatments. There's fancier uh, therapies such as DNA, RNA that we want to get into our brain, viruses where we want to deliver drugs through virus. Um, and uh, stem cells uh, or different kinds of cell therapies that we want to actually get into the brain to be able to, to, to do work as, as treatments. <clears throat> but because of the blood-brain barrier, these are kept out. And so what focused ultrasound allows us to do is to very temporarily open up the blood-brain barrier. And how does it do that? It's shown here in this diagram, and I'll just maybe describe what it's showing. So as I mentioned, uh, the blood-brain barrier is a connection of cells, which are shown here. This right in here is uh, where your blood is. This out here is the brain where you would want treatments to get. But there's this physical barrier of cells that are in close proximity to each other, preventing things from moving from the blood to the brain. What focused ultrasound does is if, when, and if and when we inject um, uh, what we call micro bubbles, so literally small little bubbles of air given intravenously that what the ultrasound does 
is it causes them to vibrate and expand and contract. And the physical movement of these little, little um, air bubbles that eventually gets absorbed, they actually cause the close opposed cells to separate just briefly, temporarily, so that things can actually pass between the two cells into the brain. And this is a technology that has been um, uh, very actively studied in many centers in the world, one in particular in Toronto by uh, colleagues um, uh, at uh, Sunnybrook Hospital, uh, Dr. Lipsman and Dr. Clairbo, who we've been collaborating with. And they've been using this technology to open up the blood-brain barrier in a variety of different scenarios. One example here is Alzheimer's disease. So this is just a picture of an MRI of a brain. Um, and what is being demonstrated here is if you look at this very small uh, triangle of brightness, that's an area where a dye has been uh, given through the intravenous and has shown up um, in the area where the focused ultrasound was delivered, showing that the dye can actually get into the brain because the blood-brain barrier has temporarily opened. And then if you wait a period of time, give the dye again, you can see that the dye is no longer visible in the brain, indicating that the dye could not get through the blood-brain barrier because the blood-brain barrier was only temporarily open and closed up again. Um, colleagues in Spain have used this to open up the blood-brain barrier in Parkinson's disease dementia. And what we wanted to do in collaboration with our colleagues um, at Sunnybrook Hospital was to try and actually deliver a drug uh, using this technology because that had not yet been done. And we wanted to do this in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and um, there were, of course, a number of different types of drugs. You know, I, I talked through the different ones that don't cross the blood brain barrier that one could potentially use. And what we actually settled on testing was an enzyme, which is a kind of protein. And in fact, it was an enzyme that is a repurposed drug. So I, I told you earlier about this enzyme glucocerebrosidase, which is under functioning in Parkinson's disease and where the hope is that Ambroxol can activate it. Um, this actual enzyme exists uh, as a, uh, a product that can be given intravenously. It's developed for a condition called Gaucher disease, uh, where somebody has mutations in both of their GBA genes and is used um, routinely for treating Gaucher disease, which is a rare disease. And Gaucher disease typically though, um, it just needs to get to the rest of the body, the liver, the blood, the bone. It doesn't necessarily need to get to the brain. Whereas in Parkinson's disease, our idea was that if glucocerebrosidase is under functioning in Parkinson's disease brain, then if we gave the brain more functioning glucocerebrosidase, this might be beneficial. And so there was biological rationale for us to use this as a drug to deliver in Parkinson's disease brains. Like I mentioned, it's been used in Gaucher disease for a very long time now, and so it has a good safety profile. And it's actually a drug, it's accessible. We can actually purchase it and we're able to do so in this clinical trial. And so we did a very, very small clinical trial at the phase one stage. It's a new technology, so we wanted to check and do initial testing, pilot testing, to see if it was safe. We wanted to deliver it deep into the brain in an area of the brain called the striatum, which is the area of the brain where the substantia nigra actually communicates with. Um, and we tested this in four different individuals with Parkinson's disease who had a mutation in one of their GBA genes. This is uh, just a depiction to show, again, those bright spots that tell us that the blood-brain barrier was opened. If you just maybe focus on the middle panel here, these are the four different um, uh, participants in the clinical trial. And you can see these bright spots here sh shown by the arrows of where the blood-brain barrier was opened when we were delivering this drug. This was primarily a safety trial, so we were really looking for signals of reasons why we shouldn't move ahead if there were aspects related to the tolerability of the procedure or the drug itself or using the drug in combination with the technology in people with Parkinson's disease. And uh, we found that overall, there were really no significant, there were, there were some adverse events, but nothing severe uh, and nothing that indicated to us that this wasn't a feasible uh, therapy to potentially investigate further, which is what we are doing now. So with that, I just wanted to come back with a couple of takeaway points. Um, I just wanted to kind of emphasize that drug repurposing is a strategy and just one strategy that we're using to find new therapies for Parkinson's disease. These are among drugs that are already approved and or in use to treat other diseases. 
Um, drug repurposing, I do think, has the potential to reduce the time and cost of finding disease-modifying therapies. And this is why I think it should be an approach that we still continue to, to fund and we still continue to, um, to advocate for. Although I will also say it shouldn't be our only strategy. And that's because I think the point at the bottom, and I think this is uh, beautifully put with the uh, you know, known silver bullet uh, uh, kind of uh, sentiment, is that I think that the treatments for Parkinson's in the future is not going to be a single disease modifying therapy. I don't think one day somebody's going to come out with one drug for all people at all stages of disease. And therefore, I think we need to think broadly. I think we need to um, not folk put all our eggs in one basket. basket. Uh, and I think we really need uh, a lot of a lot of people um, working uh, working away at trying to find uh, new treatments uh, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me to talk. I look forward to our conversation. Um, and um, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Thank you for a very inspiring presentation. I'm sure that actually everyone would have been amazed like I was by the the benefits of using artificial intelligence to allow you to move much faster than you would have moved in the past, which opens a new dimension, I guess, in your research. And uh, temporarily opening the uh, blood-brain barrier is something that was quite new to me as a concept when I heard about it first in Barcelona, when you spoke about it. And um, to our audience, we will have the pleasure of listening to uh, Raul Martinez in February next year, uh, who is one of the uh, Spanish specialists you were referring to, I guess. Yeah. We'll be focusing. We'll be focusing. Sorry for the pun. Uh, we'll be focusing on fuss, on focused ultrasound, and we'll talk about it uh, in more detail next year. Let's just have a look at the questions that have been uh, waiting for us as you were presenting. I think the first question is from John, and John is asking whether uh, there is also an effort to find repurposed drugs suitable for atypical Parkinsonism. I guess uh, things such as uh, dementia with Lewy bodies or MSA and other other variations of this beautiful illness. Yes, for sure. Um, and I didn't touch on repurposing in those areas at all, but I could tell you I was recently just reviewing the literature and and I mean, there's a couple, I think, of, of aspects here. So one aspect I think related to, for example, multiple system atrophy, um, you know, our hope is that uh, research out of multiple system atrophy is going to be beneficial for Parkinson's disease and research for Parkinson's disease is gonna be beneficial for multiple system atrophy in part and largely in part because this protein alpha nucleus we think is a culprit in both it probably behaves differently in both and is probably doing something different in both diseases but um the idea is that uh if there are uh, drugs that we find in um in one um, context that is uh you know reduces bad alpha nucleus that it would make sense that at least testing it, uh, and uh, there's 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 feasibility that it might be helpful in the other. So I think with the repurposing aspects, I think you're going to see that there's a lot of um, uh, if some of these drugs look useful in um, in a Parkinson's disease, um, there will probably be many that will then start to be tested in um, MSA. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, some people are even doing the reverse strategy that because MSA is a rare disease. Um, that in some cases, if they have a compound that looks good related to alpha nucleus, they're actually starting to test in MSA. And if there's a good signal in MSA, then thinking about testing in, um, in uh, Parkinson's disease. But I think Exenatide is a great example of um, you know, a drug that's being tested right now in dementia with Lewy bodies um, and Parkinson's disease dementia because of this idea that it's helpful uh, related to all of these different um, biological um, effects it has uh, that's beneficial for Parkinson's disease. Um, so for the tauopathies or the, the conditions that have tau as a, as a culprit protein, such as progressive supranuclear palsy, um, yes, definitely repurposing can be used in that strategy, uh, for, for, for that strategy as well. Um, and, and there are definitely groups who are doing that. Um, the important piece is, I mean, the, is having the right models to test them in. Uh, you know, I think the approach of um, having a, a drug that looks promising is not, even though it's a safe drug um, that's been shown to be used for other indications, it definitely shouldn't be a drug that we just use in humans for, for progressive nuclear, nuclear palsy. It needs 
good um, testing in the laboratory, I think, for us to justify mm -hmm. um, even even if it's lower risk, the potential for risk in, in, in testing it in, in humans. And so um, there there are some uh, there's some work being done in in, in PSP, um, but I'm not quite sure where the question was coming from. But I have to say, from I wish there was more. I wish there was more work being done in the PSP space, which I imagine where this question was coming from. Um, and um, and and repurposing sounds like a a, a way uh, forward. Uh, with the same idea being that I don't think that that should be the only approach that we're using for PSP. Understood. Thank you very much, Ryan. Philippe has a question about exanotide, and he's asking whether the fact that exanotide provides benefits to both diabetic patients and people with Parkinson's, does it suggest that the disease are, the disease are linked in some way? So, for instance, would diabetics be more likely to develop PD or vice versa? Yeah. And so this is a really active area of investigation, and I think we're finding links that we didn't appreciate before. And I think part of, uh, again, getting back to some of the benefits of, uh, you know, we, we talk about repurposed drugs and the hope that we're going to develop um, uh, therapies from it. But I think even just the exercise of studying these drugs teaches us more about the disease. Uh, and I think uh, before... Um, uh, before the appreciation of, of the potential role for exanotide as a treatment, I think we weren't, um, that the connection between diabetes and Parkinson's disease wasn't that clear, but it's becoming clear both from the experimental point of view, from epidemiological point of view. So looking at people who have diabetes, are they at a higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease? I think data now is coming out to, to suggest that there, there is a link. Um, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's still early days, but I think it's going to open up an area, um, of, uh, further investigation that we haven't looked at before and its relation, you know, it will probably bring us down this path of talking about inflammation and, 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 uh, how, um, how that's related to Parkinson's disease, which again, I think, um, you know, if we were talking about this a couple of decades ago, we would be saying, yeah, it probably doesn't have a big role. Whereas now. Uh, we know that uh, it, it probably has, um, in many cases, a, a potential inciting role. Thank you very much. The next question is about the Parkinson's hope list that shows six therapies in phase three, uh, as far as disease modifying trials are concerned. Exenotide, Ambroxol, which you discussed, and then memantine that we didn't talk too much about. So that person is asking whether you can say a few more words about memantine and perhaps also in, on some other phase three drugs, if you're familiar with them, like Buntanetap, uh, or linked Z, and one that is like a succession of letters and numbers. I will let you just pick it up from the question yourself. Yeah, let me look at those. Yeah, so Memantine, um, I... So I can tell you what memantine is. I don't know where the phase three is at with memantine. So memantine is a drug that was developed for um, Alzheimer's disease, actually. Uh, and um, it has an indication for, for uh, improving, uh, well, uh, reducing progression of memory loss in, 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 in Alzheimer's disease because it acts at a receptor called the NMDA receptor, which is important for learning and memory in the brain. Uh, the NMDA receptor is also important for... Um, maintaining um well when it goes when it goes when it behaves inappropriately um it can actually lead to uh what we call excitotoxicity which means that a cell um the the receptor is too active um and then uh, it causes a brain cell to die and in stroke probably these nmda receptors get overactivated and 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 result in in damage in stroke and there was, there's an ongoing thought and I think uh, ongoing data to support that probably in chronic neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's disease, the NMDA receptor might also be dysfunctional. And so, um, again, I'm not involved in this phase three trial, but my, my expectation would be the speculation here or the hypothesis here would be that by blocking these receptors with memantine, there might be some capability of reducing this excitotoxicity in Parkinson's disease. Um, and that would be the rationale here. But I actually don't know where that phase three trial is at in terms of if it's been completed, if mm. it's been reported or not. Um, and uh, and uh, so, 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 so I can't update on that. Um, regarding the next compound, uh, butenetap, 
Um, it's an interesting compound. It's a small molecule um, that is in a phase three trial after being in a very, very short phase two trial. So I think the phase two trial was something like a month or two long, um, but it's a compound that seems to reduce the brain from producing certain proteins or at least producing lower amounts of proteins. Um, and it does this by a certain uh, sequence, uh, a DNA sequence that sits uh, in the gene. And so the proteins, interestingly, that it's been shown to reduce um, production of are alpha synuclein, um, APP, which is the precursor pro protein for uh, A-beta, which is uh, a protein involved in, in um, Alzheimer's disease, as well as a protein, Huntington, uh, which is involved in Huntington's disease. And so uh, it is now in a phase three trial in Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's currently ongoing. So, so no updates uh, for that. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I guess the, the, the um, I'm, I'm not certain with the very short phase two trial, um, whether or not a single phase three trial is gonna be sufficient or if maybe there'll be some outcomes from that that's gonna have to lead to additional investigation. Uh, but that's what that much. truck is. And sorry, then the last one, so Lin, Ling Z, I'm not quite sure what, what that is. And then the B11, B122, um, I believe is, I'm not sure if it's actually in a phase three trial. I think that is the LERC2 kinase inhibitor, um, <clears throat> which is um, a small molecule that was developed uh, to inhibit a different type of enzyme. So not glucose reversidase in our brain, but uh, there's an enzyme called LERC2, which is, is overactive in the brains of people who have a mutation in the LERC2 gene. Um, and uh, we think that it's probably overactive in the brains of people who have Parkinson's disease, uh, at least a subset of them. And so if you have a way to, to quiet down that enzyme, make it less mm. active, um, that's what uh, the intention of that drug was. Although I think it's only in the phase uh, two or uh, yeah, uh, it's um, it's being tested in, in people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease right now, um, with the uh, plan for it to also be tested in people who have that lurk two mutation. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen Moto. Hello, Stephen, a well-known member of uh, No Save the Bullet. Um, Stephen is asking whether one of your slides showed that acetaminophen, which is paracetamol, also had potential benefits in PV. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you saw that probably in, um, in Kevin's figure. Um, yeah. And uh, as I was alluding to earlier, I, there, there would be, I imagine there was going to be a time when we we're going to be brought down the path of talking about inflammation uh, and the immune system. Um, and uh, I think that the acetaminophen is a, a clear demonstration of, or, or maybe you were saying that, that that was in our drugs of what we tested, because um, that was also in our repurposed list of drugs too. But definitely um, the idea of testing anti-inflammatories as a, as a repurposing strategy is, is very active. So azathioprine, for example, which is an immunosuppressant, um, that's in a clinical trial uh, being funded by Cure Parkinson's. Um, and so uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen, ibuprofen, all of these medications um, have been looked at uh, epidemiologically. Um, and the, depending on which study you look at, the, the results are, are variable. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that there's enough signal there that, um, that the idea of using some kind of anti-inflammatory. And that's going to be, I think, an area that we're going to see a lot of active investigation and, and, and are currently seeing a lot of ant, uh, active investigation. Some of the drugs that aren't repurposed, but are in the disease modifying therapy um, space uh, for, mm -hmm. for clinical trials are ones that tackle the immune uh, system and, the, uh, and inflammation. And so I think we'll keep a close eye on those also to see if um, uh, you know, you know what, the, what they're going to show us. Thank you very much, Ryan. I'm sure, like uh, many of us, you heard about desulfofibrio when the University of uh, Helsinki uh, basically referred to that new, well, that, that, that hot topic uh, bacteria, desulfofibrio, uh, that basically enhances alpha-synuclein aggregation in Parkinson's disease. Uh, Nico is asking whether you have basically heard about that and whether uh, he's, he's basically he's mentioning that he's, he knows a company that produces GMP. I'm not trying to pronounce the full letters, the full the full word that it represents. 
GMP, which is a product that would basically counter the negative effects of basal flow fibrio. Is that something you're familiar with? Um, was it, do, is it listed here? Yes, Nico. Yeah, sorry, I don't see it, but, but it's, okay. it, it's uh probiotic related, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, th it, I think possibly because basically what he's basically saying is asking whether you are aware of those recent discoveries about the for fibrio, um, the impact it has on alpha synuclein. And he also has read that something close, I will try to pronounce it, glycom scrop peptides, which is GMP, um, can eliminate this bacteria. Is it a topic that is on your radar screen? Yeah, so there's definitely, uh, I'm not sure, I, I can never keep the names of the of the <laughs> bacteria in my brain. So I'm not quite sure if it's going to be the same one or or if not, I'm sure there's, there's multiple. Uh, so, I mean, there's colleagues in Edinburgh who've been uh, looking at different um, strains of uh, bacteria that are harmful or helpful. Um, and then are there probiotics that can, um, or, or, or antibiotics that can affect them um, in, in a good or a bad way. And so I think there's a lot of different um, uh, areas of investigation that are finding certain uh, microbiota uh, that do have either the capability of facilitating alpha nucleon aggregation, and so you'd wanna get rid of those bacteria, or, uh, or might be protective, reducing alpha nucleon aggregation. And so you'd want to enhance um, the, the presence of those bacteria. And I think this is a really interesting um, area of investigation. And, and so, you know, there is a clinical trial. I don't know if it started yet, but based on actually warm work, so C. elegans work uh, done by a colleague in Edinburgh, uh, where they're going to be testing a drug to enhance um, enhance or reduce a certain uh, bacteria exactly with the intention of potentially having a downstream effect on alpha synuclein. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is one avenue of investigation for probiotics, prebiotics, uh, but there's, there's, I think there's going to be a lot that we're going to learn um, and different um, areas of biology, uh, not necessarily just alpha synuclein related, mm. that affecting the microbiota is going to eventually have some influence on, on functioning of, of neurons and um, how the, the disease potentially gets from the gut to the brain. Um, I think this is a very early area and it, it becomes complicated. Um, it's not an area that I study, but I, 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 I highly respect the people who do because the, like the, the gut is just full of all of these different organisms, some we've never even heard of before. And to try and, 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 and of course it's influenced by everything, right? It's influenced by what we eat, by where we live, by uh, what medications we take. And so there's a lot, a lot of signal and noise I mean, there's a lot of noise that you have to kind of work through to understand the signal. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think we're getting closer um, and I think it's, it's an area to keep uh, definitely your eye out for because from a, mm -hmm. from a and I can see why the question is asked, but from a, um, a application point of view, if you just had a pill that was a probiotic to take, um, you can see that that would be very uh, attractive. A totally different topic here. Actually, I don't know if you're familiar with the B1, the high doses of vitamins B1 therapy, uh, which basically was uh, launched by an Italian neurologist called Professor Constantini. And we have two people in the audience uh, asking whether you have, you have investigated the use of B1, uh, high dose of thiamine. Uh, are you, do you have a view on this? Yeah, so that, that's I have not investigated it a, a, at all, uh, and uh, so it's it's not not an area that uh, that I've investigated, and I can't okay. uh, I can't really comment on, on okay. what we have in the laboratory because we haven't looked at it. Thank you, Lorraine. Another question from from Stephen, who is asking, whether you have any comments about vaccinations to prevent the accumulation of alpha synuclein? Um, do I have opinions about it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's a uh, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> there are um, you know two strategies that are a very active areas of investigation, uh, and maybe when I talking about uh, you know repurposing and making sure that we have other areas of investigation, I think we need a broad spectrum of investigation into Parkinson's disease. And so, as you are probably all aware, there are two different ways that you can use um, antibodies to affect alpha synuclein. And one is you just give antibodies, right? You make them in the laboratory, you put them uh, in, uh, in um, 
them intravenous and you deliver them that way. Um, and that's an ongoing, um, I, I'm, so that should actually be in the phase three, um, uh, phase three list of, of, of uh, drugs that are being tested because there is an actual phase three trial that's, uh, that's continued on from the phase three trial, looking at an anti alpha nucleum antibody through this approach. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and th there's challenges, I mean, with it. And I can also tell you from the most recent uh, um, uh, meeting that I was at, um, some of the follow-up data looks looks promising. So I think we're going to have to look into 2024 to hopefully see what the readout from that clinical trial is. Um, but I think there's some initial promising data. Um, that some of the challenges with it go back to the blood-brain barrier. So antibodies are big. Um, are enough antibodies getting into the brain with this approach? Um, uh, that we don't know. Um, and uh, hopefully the clinical trials will tell us more. And then the other approach is what mm -hmm. was just being alluded to, which is actually getting vaccinated. So uh, getting injected with a little peptide uh, that makes your own body make antibodies. So you, your body makes the antibodies as opposed to somebody making it in the laboratory with the same intent of it actually going into the brain and uh, stopping up uh, bad alpha nucleus. And again, there's caveats around that in that uh, those antibodies still have to get into your brain. Um, and then the question becomes whether or not antibodies are able to, to get rid of the alpha nucleus that needs to, be, it needs to be disposed of because what antibodies can really do primarily is get rid of alpha nucleus that lives outside of cells. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that alpha nucleus inside of cells is also harmful. And so without it being, without antibodies kind of being able to get into cells, and there's, again, new technologies that are developing to make antibodies be able to get into cells. And, and that's going to, we'll, we'll see that happening, I think, in the next decade or so. Um, but without um, those antibodies kind of getting into cells, I, I'm uncertain whether or not we're going to be able to get rid of all of the kind of bad alpha nucleus. And so there might mm. be only certain scenarios where, where, where these uh, should be um, applied. But, but I definitely think it's, it's worthwhile area of investigation um uh and uh, and yeah i i look forward to seeing what uh what these clinical trials show us and so the you know in i think it's a phase one still in phase one trials but the immunization where you take a peptide and and inject people and actually immunize them to make their own antibodies those are there there's a, there's at least one phase one clinical trial um that's that's starting uh, uh related to that Thank you. Jenny is asking whether when repurposing drugs, is it possible to determine what constituent part or parts of a drug actually work on the PD symptoms? He's taking the example of amentadine. Uh, he had it for his dyskinesia and it worked very well to reduce the dyskinesia, but unfortunately it made his other PD symptoms worse and he had to come off it. And that's a wonderful question. Um, and I didn't get into it at all. So the the beauty of repurposing is that you have your access to all of these drugs and you can, you know, just throw them at this problem and say, which one, which of these drugs can fix this problem? But um, you're often left with, how is it, how does it work? So, uh, you know, if I give you the example of rifibutin in our laboratory, I mean, this drug is, uh, you know, and same with if you, if you look at amantadine, I mean, amantadine was developed as an antiviral. Rifibutin is an antimicrobial drug. Um, and so there's a way that we think, well, there's a way that we know that it works for the indication that it was made, but it clearly is not that indicate that that mechanism of action that's probably helping dyskinesias or probably helping, uh, you know, alpha nucleus. It's a different mechanism of action and that and that these drugs are what we call, you know, all every drug that we that we um, that we use is, is in some way, quote unquote, dirty, meaning that it doesn't have one single mechanism of action. It does a variety of things. Um, and so one of the challenges, I think, in a repurposing strategy is understanding how it is that that drug is doing what it does. And in our own work, we're trying to understand how rifibutin works because it'll tell us what aspects of um, biology are being affected by it. And then you could imagine um, you could kind of refine that. And I think similar to what the question is being asked is if we could understand the antidiskinetic effects of amantadine, then maybe you can make a drug specific for that mm. uh, and get away from the kind of side effects, because that's always what happens with, you know, drugs that have effects that we call off target, not what you want it to be doing, yes. you know, you want it to be working as an antidiskinetic, but then it's causing hallucinations, or it's causing other, you know, dry mouth or other things that you don't want. And so, um, so yes, I think, 
um, the kind of the next step from repurposing is us to say, what exactly, what further can we learn? Not just can we take a repurposed drug and get it to clinic quickly, which I think is an important aspect of it, but can we also take that repurposed drug and refine our understanding of that drug and of the disease better to then be smarter about making new drugs? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob is asking if you know the percentage of drugs that enter phase three that actually get approved in the end. The so in a question, I guess the ones that go through phase three and make it to phase four and to the market. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I, 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 I'll, I'll be guessing the number, but I, I think from, you know, beginning to end, it's, it's like I had at the beginning 10%. Um, so the number from, your chances, obviously, when you get a little bit further along, go up a little bit. Um, but uh, but I, I actually don't know the number of phase three, in phase three that end up in market. I will tell you a fact, though, that I just came across. Uh, uh, so I was just at the NDS Congress and, and reviewed kind of emerging therapies um, in movement disorders uh, for uh, a talk there. Um, and so I had to sit down with, uh, you know, clinical trials uh, and um, look at kind of what's happened over the past year in more detail. And I'll just, as a, as a, as a, as an extra fact that I'll just add in that I thought was incredibly, um, that I found incredibly optimistic is that in 2023, so this is not Parkinson's disease, but for neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so um, uh, a genetic form of ALS, um, a very rare genetic form of ataxia and Alzheimer's disease that between those three, three conditions, which are neurodegenerative diseases, there in 2023, there are going to be five FDA approved drugs, uh, which is I think remarkable. Um, I, I think to have five FDA approved drugs for neurodegenerative disease, I am hoping is an indicator of, uh, you know, a change in the tide uh, that I think that uh, this, I, I hope signals uh, a change when, you know, decades before, years before, you'd never see a drug that was approved for neurodegenerative disease. So to have five in one year, I think, um, uh, I, I think is, 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 is a promising, is a promising signal. And we have seen some big progresses being made on the Alzheimer front, admittedly slowing down the disease and being very expensive, but at least there is some movement there. So let's just hope that, that such movement is being seen on our side, on the PD side as well. Yeah. And I think the other piece too is that, you know, everybody talks about investment and things. I think that when you have five FDA approved drugs for neurodegenerative disease, because always our fear in Parkinson's disease uh, and in any neurodegenerative disease is that um, people who actually invest in getting drugs to clinic are going to be uh, steered away because there are no successes, right? Yes. Uh, so I, I, my hope is that the side effect of having five approved drugs uh, by FDA is that investors, drug companies, industry are going to say, oh, actually, drugs can come to to, to approval. And so, uh, yes, we need to invest. Uh, we need to invest in Parkinson's disease and and these other conditions. I have a last question for the road uh, for someone based in Toronto, basically says, I'm located in Toronto. Do you have any trials at the moment? Uh, great question. Uh, so, um, uh, and I should have put up uh, our email list. So we are uh, located at the Toronto Western Hospital. I think we're, well, we're definitely the largest movement disorders clinic in Canada and probably one of the largest in North America. It's really important to us um, to have clinical trials available to people who come to our clinic. I think it's part, not everybody obviously wants to be involved in research, but I think it's part of care um, to be able to offer uh, people who are interested in, in research uh, that opportunity. Um, so we have a variety of different research um, programs going on, some to understand the disease, some to try and find biomarkers. And then we always try and have at least one, uh, one trial uh, for therapy. Uh, and a disease modifying therapy. Um, the the uh, trend, um, although I think this is going to start changing, uh, has for disease modifying therapy trials has been to enroll people who are early in disease, like as you know, within three years of diagnosis, and uh, and often not on any medication. And so we do have one of those trials ongoing. It's actually testing the LERC two kinase inhibitor. Um, so if you are an early person with Parkinson's disease um, and not on therapy, then then please reach out. Um, otherwise, we don't have other therapy trials going on 
that I am aware. But that being said, uh, if you saw my email at the end, please email me. I can put you in touch with our research coordinators. We try and keep the most up to date list. And there might be there might be research projects on there that you're just interested in being a part of. So you know we're trying to be get better brain scans, and we're trying to um, to trying to just uh, even learn about the disease. So even just keeping a registry of all of your symptoms, um, a, a big population of putting together all of that for, for the country to understand Parkinson's disease in Canada. So please email me and I'll, I'll put you in touch with uh, our research coordinators and then you can kind of look through the list of things that might be suitable for you. Well, Lauren, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation today and for spending quite a bit of time answering the questions from the audience. Um, thank you also for dedicating your career to helping find a cure uh, for Parkinson's in repurposing existing drugs. So it is very important to all of us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also to Cure Parkinson's because Cure Parkinson's, the global charity, are supporting your research. And I remember that chart where we could see that a lot of the repurposed drugs that were being sponsored at the moment for repurposing uh, were supported by Cure Parkinson's, so, which is quite amazing. Their presence in your space is, uh, is overwhelming and uh, should be appreciated by all of us. And then lastly, I just wanted to say that our next session will be taking place on the, the 9th of October, 9th of October, and we'll be talking about a topic that is very rarely covered and despite being a very important topic, which is how does it feel for a woman to have Parkinson's? And our two speakers will be uh, Richelle Flanagan, who is known to quite a lot of you, and also Annaline Osterban, who works for uh, Bas Bloom, and she's a gynecologist with four kids and Parkinson's. So that's going to be an exciting session as well, and that will be on the 9th of October. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lorraine. And I wish you all a good afternoon or a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorraine.